Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. Franklin, are you all set? Can you hear me okay? We can. All right, we're ready to get started. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon for this webinar. Um, just wanted to let you know that this is being recorded. Um, all registered participants will receive an email in about a week or so with a link to this recording or a recording of this webinar and information you can use to download the presentation materials. And again, if you need captioning, there's a link in the chat box. Um, you can click on um, to do that. According to a recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine, in 2016 alone, there were 64,000 drug overdose deaths in the United States. That's more than total the number of U.S. military deaths in the Vietnam War. Many of us have experienced a drug overdose death in our family um, and or in our community. Um, these deaths can be especially difficult because of the shame and stigma um, that's associated with substance use disorder. So we hope that you found, find the information presented today helpful so that we can begin to have honest conversations about overdose death without the shame um, this disease brings. So the learning objectives for this webinar are, um, we'll discuss three key questions um, that affect bereaved people. We'll learn how the experience of grief is affected by stigma and stress, how trauma can play a role in grief, and how the dynamics of addiction and caregiving can shape a person's grief. I'm your host, Susan Halpin. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the New England region of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. I'm located at the University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, this webinar is going to last about, well, the presentation will last about 40 minutes. Um, and then we will have time for questions at the end. So if you have questions about what you're seeing or hearing, jot them down, and in the last 10 minutes or so, um, you'll have time to ask them. I just wanted to give you a little um, brief um, introduction to the National Library of Medicine if you're not familiar with it. Um, it's an actual physical library that's located on the campus of the National Institute of Health. It's the largest biomedical library in the world and one of the federal government's largest providers of digital content. All of the information from the National Library of Medicine is available online and can be accessed by anyone. It's important that you know you can trust the information you find from NLM websites and databases. Um, these resources have been written by health and medical experts. The in the information has been peer-reviewed and the information is updated continually. The mission of the NLM is to advance the progress of medicine and improve public health by making health and medical information accessible to everyone. The NLM carries out its mission through a national network that has about 7,000 members across the United States. NLM also offers free training classes as well as grant funding for innovative programs and projects that bring our resources into the community. The NLM National Network members are people like you. Um, they come from all different professions, librarians, healthcare providers, public health professionals, educators, students, researchers, first responders, and the general public. Anyone can join the network and receive information about the training we offer. Last year, the network provided training to about 77,000 people. 
The NLM provides an extensive amount of information about how to prevent and treat substance use disorder. You will receive this list of substance use disorder resources as well as a list of our mental health resources when you receive the recording link from this webinar. If you're located in New England, and um, you do any kind of programming, um, I'm just going to mention quickly our Graphic Medicine Book Club. Um, it's an opportunity to um, borrow a club kit and um, have your um, organization read, read a book, and um, there are discussion questions and NLM resources available. So you can contact Sarah, um, that's my colleague here in um, the New England region, and she can give you more information about how to order this kit. And you can also find um, more information if you go to the link um, that says to request a kit. All right, now I'd like to introduce our webinar presenter, Franklin Cook. Franklin, I'm passing the ball over to you. Sorry. The system is just a teeny bit slow. All right, you should be all set now. Okay, can you see my uh, slide okay? Yes, that's great. Okay, great. Thank you for uh, joining me today, everyone. And uh, I'd like to thank the New England Region of National Network of Libraries of Medicine and especially Susan for being our host today. I'll start just with a little background about myself. I'm a pure grief helper, a trainer, and advocate. I've done this work for about 20 years. I focus my attention on uh, grief after suicide, after a death from substance use, and I work with uh, families in the military who've lost a loved one. Uh, I have strong personal connections to this topic. Uh, my father died of suicide 40 years ago, and he had substance use disorder, which directly contributed to his death. Myself and two of my brothers and my daughter are all in uh, recovery. There's two projects that I'm working on right now uh, in this uh, area, one with my service providers who uh, experience um, uh, many deaths, and then I'm working on a new project that focuses on uh, trying to figure out how we can strengthen the support for the bereaved uh, in Massachusetts. So we'll start today by looking at grief in general or grief from any manner of death in order to give us some context. Uh, and then we'll just move right in and the rest of it is about grief after substance use death. So the first um, uh, principle that uh, is important is that uh, grief is a natural phenomena. It's not a malady. Uh, there's not something wrong with a person uh, who is bereaved or there's not something that needs to be fixed. People live their way through grief or, or it's, it's, an experiential, um, it's an experiential process. We're going to talk a lot about what people think about and feel during the presentation, but they're actually doing that as they navigate their world. And what grief really needs is just um, space for it to be what it already is, okay? Grief is very individualistic. Uh, the deceased person is a unique individual, the survivor is a unique individual, and the relationship is a unique relationship. One thing that happens during grief is people recreate their life story um, in the changed world without their loved one, and that is a one-of-a-kind creation. Grief serves a purpose. Uh, grief is linked to love in that we only grieve the death of people who we are bonded to in, in, in some uh, profound way. Uh, grieving is a process of making meaning. So as people are going through that, what we said, experience and recreating their story, they're actually making meaning out of, uh, out of what happened to their loved one and what is happening to them. And then finally, uh, grief evolves over the bereaved's lifetime. 
we carry our people with us, uh, so to speak. And one of the things that, you know, we need to make space for, for all of us, is for us to experience our grief and share our grief um, over the course of our lives. So the other slide about general grief is, will, uh, this is based on, it's adapted from Warden's uh, uh, four tasks of mourning. Basically the couple things to uh, keep in mind about this and about the whole presentation is it's presented in, in sequence and none of this happens in, uh, in sequence. It's presented as if it's organized or in separate pieces and it is all intertwined. So the one task of grief is facing the reality of the loss. So people come to acknowledge that uh, uh, they no longer have access to the person who died, that death is irreversible, and that uh, death is permanent. And so coming to this reality helps a person move into, or actually is the only way a person can move into that changed world without, without their loved one. Coping with the pain of grief is a, is a remarkable experience because the pain of grief is a unique kind of grief and a powerful kind of grief. Um, and I also put emotions here in parentheses, which is a great deal of what we're going to talk about. And my point of doing it that way is simply that emotions are different, but the emotions of grief and the pain of grief are intertwined. And I hope that that is uh, something that you just see throughout what I'm talking about today in, in the presentation. Living in a world without the person, uh, that task of grief is what we refer to when we talked about a person having an experience of grief. I think it of I think of it as navigating the world without the person. There was uh, the life before the person died and then the life after the person died. The bereaved person needs to um, navigate their way through that world and doing that without their loved one is grieving. Exploring continuing bonds. Basically, we have an ongoing relationship with a deceased person. And that relationship is like a live relationship. It's not the same, but it evolves, it's dynamic, um, continue to relate to the person. Um, and that's a very, very important task of grief. And finally, engaging in the next phase of life. So um, at first, uh, people primarily participate in their lives, um, but at some point, um, and it's not necessarily a point, but incrementally, life starts to open up and life starts to that life that is new and changed becomes your life and and it becomes okay not okay that the person is gone but it becomes a place where you can find fruition and where you can you can thrive so now we'll turn to um uh the rest of the presentation is this screen right here tells us everything we're going to talk about now and we're going to talk about why I intention, prevention, stigma, trauma, distress, and living with substance use um, and addiction and how that affects a person after, after, after uh, their loved one dies. And the thing I want you to keep in mind about this is this is an entire framework. My, my purpose here is to help us understand grief after a death from substance use better because by understanding it, we can understand what the person is going through. And that is the foundation uh, for, for, for helping the person uh, more, more effectively and, and just more compassionately. So the, the question why, and now remember, from now on we're focusing right in on not just why, which everybody asks about a death, but why did my person die of uh, substance use? Why did my person die of addiction? And there are several aspects of this. Uh, people uh, need to look at what actually happened, and that's part of the story that they're making. That's part of what they're doing to, to go through their grief is figuring out what happened, A, B, C, D, what caused what. And this is really important that my person died of substance use, my person died of addiction. So coming to an understanding of that can be very helpful, and that's, that's what people try to do. And that they may misunderstand it, or this may not be their focus, but it's very, it's very helpful if they, if they do do that generally. There's also a metaphysical element to this question why, which is basically, why did this happen to my person? And again, this meaning why did addiction take my person from me? Why did addiction uh, affect my family like this? Why, why did it affect me? 
And it also uh, affects a person's view of their, their overall meaning of life, the larger meaning of their values and their belief system. How does the fact that addiction killed my person um, alter that or, or, or affect that? And finally, it can, the fact that addiction took my person's life can uh, affect the continuing relationship, this continuing bond that we've talked about, so that, so that a person might keep the relationship closer to their vest, so to speak. Or on the other hand, they might go out and do something active around substance use or addiction. So that, that, that relationship is different simply because the death was from substance use. So with each of these um, themes, we'll look at the emotional responses that, uh, that come from them. And these are just a few examples, just to give an idea that what we're looking at is what lies beneath or what lies behind these emotions by looking at it this way through, through these themes. So a person might feel shock or disbelief or confusion because uh, substance, this, this addiction is what took my person. Um, they might feel helplessness, hopelessness, anger, because addiction is so powerful and so insidious that it generates those kind of feelings to come to that real realization. Um, and they might feel relief over the end of the person's suffering. And we'll talk a little bit more about relief uh, later on in the, in the presentation. So the next theme is intention, and this is uh, an enormously important thing around, um, around substance use and addiction because it's really what causes our society to make judgments about, about um, um, uh, the disease of addiction. On a personal level, then, as, a, as a person looks at that my person died of, 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 of substance use, there's a fundamental question. It is how much willfulness or control was involved? Did they have dominion over what was happening? Or what were the limitations on their choice or freedom, you know, did, did the disease process take over in some way? That is very central to uh, people's grief experience, to their, to their reaction, and that, that affects their grief, depending on how they look at that. There's also two dom domains where people look at this issue. One is just that immediate um, a time before the, the person dies, what were the actions and decisions there um, that, that basically took the person's life, and, and how, how was my person person's control or, or lack of it uh, influenced that. And then the other thing that's important to think is that over the course, people who are bereaved over the course of their person's life, and again, we're focusing on addiction and, and looks at the hundreds of decisions and actions from, from, from way back. And, and that's part of, the, part of the thread of how they see their person and how they see their person's death, that there were decisions and actions all along. And were those, or, 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 or were they something that happened to them? person. So the emotional uh, responses that people might experience over intention are shock and disbelief because, because it kind of is unbelievable that a person causes their own death in, in, in this way. And so that people are shocking. Uh, anger and blame because, because if we're leaning toward that the person acted volitionally, then that can make people very angry. And it can make them very blaming toward, toward the person um, himself. Abandonment, and it's not just abandonment over that the person left me because of, of you know, preferred doing drugs. And again, if they have that perception, preferred doing drugs over being with me, but it's also a, can be a rejection of my values or, or my way of life, rejection of the assistance I offered. Then also uh, helplessness and, and guilt. So, so so the bereaved person may just perceive uh, that that, uh, that they failed uh, to aid or influence the person and couldn't affect you know whether or not they could make choices and, and, and take actions uh, to to help um, to help them stay alive and help them uh, enter into recovery. There's another um, there's another uh, large aspect of of intention when it comes to accident versus suicide, which which has a very uh, a uh, strong impact on on uh, on people when when uh, this confusion about this comes into play. So, the first thing that can happen is that, the, and this happens more than more than you realize. There's a delayed uh, official determination. 
so that the that the bereaved are left in limbo left in limbo as to whether the cause of death was accidental or or if it was suicide and that can be extraordinarily uh distressful uh disagreements about the manner of death uh between the family and the medical examiner between family members between the family and you know people outside of the family circle and the emotional responses to this are, first of all, of course, the confusion that we talked about. I know my person died, but it has a profound effect on my grief if I don't know. It's part of that need to know what happened and, and why it happened. And if there's no certainty about that, that can be very uh, distressing. And this whole disagreement about, uh, about the manner of death can be uh, – can be filled with strife, and that strife can be uh, among family members to the point where even it can fracture um, fracture uh, family relationships, and that and that does happen. And then uh, finally, and again, I'm just giving a few examples just to give us the taste of how these things uh, result in the emotions of grief, and then those emotions are are what inter, inter, intertwines with the pain that people are experiencing. So helplessness. Uh, from lacking power and control, and it's not power and control over the person's death, but it's they don't have any say so over the determination, or they're 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 not being listened to about what they view is the actual manner of, of death, and so that can bring up a sense of helplessness. Uh, the next uh, the next theme is is prevention, and I would say that is is. Uh, I don't know if it's universal because I, I wouldn't say anything is universal, but the first thing that, that very often happens is people say, well, couldn't this have been prevented? Couldn't this prevented been prevented? And very often, actually, they, they, they believe it could have. The answer, the answer is yes. And so then they enter, um, they enter uh, uh, a look at how could it have been prevented? Who could have prevented it? What could have prevented it? And again, you can see again how just this, knowledge or or this this uh, awareness of what addiction is and what substance use is and how it operates comes into this and all, all of that uh, uh, affects a person's grief experience they come up very often with specific answers and they get focused on you know what what could have happened or what should happen or who didn't or did do things that uh, were in the causal chain that led a, led to the person's death uh, this is also with 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 uh, with the death from substance use. This can be a very very uh, difficult process. People, no matter what they, even if they die from 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 addiction from an overdose, uh, there's always multiple causal factors involved. Uh, the treatment system is complicated, and people delve into that to figure out um, uh, if it could have been prevented and how. The epidemic is, is ongoing, and so there is something about the immensity of the epidemic that makes people feel as if, well, none of this can be prevented um, in the extreme. It can make them feel that way. And then finally, um, they don't necessarily get satisfaction over over this uh, over grappling with prevention. You know, and actually, throughout this whole thing, when I put up these these examples. It may seem as if, well, people have this issue around intention or prevention, and then they come to a solution. And in fact, that's not the case. Sometimes the answer is, I can't know whether whether um, whether it could have been prevented. I can't know uh, who was accountable. I can't get satisfaction over it. The emotional responses uh, to prevention include anger and blame. Again, the the People, there are many, many things that can be the brunt of the anger and blame over death from substance use. We already said the person himself. Um, it can be caregivers. It can be family members. It can be fate. It can be God. It can be anger at addiction itself. So anger and blame looms large uh, in death from substance use. Guilt and shame, although we've already uh, alluded to to it. It's just really important to, to focus on it here when it comes to prevention because the, the person has the perception that there's something they should or could have done that would have made the difference, okay, or there's something they, they did that, that was directly causal, and that is a, 
an extraordinary ex experience of, of, of guilt uh, over not preventing it. Shock, disbelief, and helplessness. If something can be prevented that is fatal and it wasn't, that is extraordinarily um, upsetting and it can make a person feel well, then I feel helpless and, and that will affect their grief as well. And then finally, uh, fear, because once this happens to your person, you know it can happen to anyone. And so inside your family circle, you begin to be worried, and sometimes in the extreme, and especially if there are vulnerable people in your circle, vulnerable to, to, um, to addiction or to substance use, then that fear becomes, you know, it can become overwhelming and cause people to be hypervigilant and, um, you know, just, just really – um, unreasonable almost in, 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 in trying to keep people from, uh, from behaving in ways that, that might take their lives. Okay, now we'll turn to stigma. Uh, stigma, uh, man, it is a powerful, insidious force that has terrible effects on uh, people uh, bereaved by uh, substance use. And that's because stigma is, the root of stigma is actually malevolent. Uh, stigma comes from prejudice and discrimination. Uh, people, people believing incorrect um, and mean-spirited things about a subgroup or people actually treating a subgroup differently on account of those beliefs. Uh, the kind of grief, uh, or one way to look at the kind of grief that comes out of stigma is uh, disenfranchised grief. So what stigma causes is people to uh, see the deceased as not as important as other people who have died, their loss not to be uh, as important as the loss of other people who have died. Uh, the bereaved not as deserving, not as deserving of comfort, not as deserving as the as the of the regular uh, social social uh, interactions that go with uh, with uh, wishing people condolences and all that, or the bereaved not not eligible. And 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 a good example of that would be so if parents are estranged from their child for a long time and then the child dies, then people sometimes uh, look at them as if they're not eligible. To, to be bereaved because they were separated because they'd let their person go or whatever. So that is, uh, that is all about stigma. The, the, uh, uh, the most powerful and, and, and disturbing thing that the stigma, that stigma causes is isolation and disconnectedness. And, and I say it's, it's disturbing because it, that has real, uh, negative effects on people who, who are grieving. It increases the pain of their loss. Uh, it Because I'm alone, I am, I'm outside the community, I don't get the comfort and support that, that, I, that I need. And it also positions communities as judges. And, and what I mean by that is I'm not just being judged by a person. I'm being judged by my family community or or by my work community or by my faith community, I'm being judged by my community at large. And so that is a, that is a more painful um, experience of, of, of being judged. The emotional responses uh, to uh, stigma are, uh, first of all, shame. And let me just say this, if you, needed to design a tool to cause people the most excruciating stigma, you could not design a better tool to do that than, um, than shame. So, and, and, that's, and, that's, uh, and that's because shame is the judgment, not just that you've done something bad, but that you are bad. And, and again, just think about a person who's grieving and, and having that feeling of that I'm, I'm bad, you know, Guilt is that you did something bad, and guilt is 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 seen mostly as being redeemable. But shame is not. You you are that way. You know that's what shame tells you. And so, um, 
uh, so people are judged and mistreated, that also uh, results in anger. And I can just tell you uh, from my personal experience to, to, uh, to have stigma um, perpetrated upon you and upon your loved one when you're in the throes of grief um, can make you angry, angrier than, than a person ought to be and affect your grief. Uh, being on your own, okay, Feeling ostracized increases a person's fear. They don't have security when they're, as when they're a part of the group, and it increases their sense of hopelessness. And finally, uh, I just want to talk about, it's not that stigma causes feelings of relief. This, this, uh, this uh, kind of sidebar doesn't really go on this slide, but it's, it's related to stigma. So I just want to talk about uh, some special things about uh, feeling relief that go with an overdose death. And basically it is that, um, that like, like if a person, for instance, I mean to say, if a person dies of cancer, it is, it is natural, it is, it is common and generally acceptable for people to say, um, oh man, I'm so, I'm so relieved, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're relieved from their suffering. Uh, it's, it's, it's also common while the person is alive and, and suffering terribly for people to not, not to wish they were dead. That's, that's not what I mean at all, but to wish that their pain was relieved, to wish that they would go so that their pain could be relieved. Well, with, with, um, with people who feel relief around a, a death by addiction, sometimes that stigma comes in and, and, and causes them to be judged over feeling relief because people don't have the same sympathy for, for the for the um, for the pain of of living with addiction or of, of the of the person who's addicted of their suffering and 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 uh, people who uh, are relieved naturally feel that when that suffering is over they naturally feel a sense of relief and I think sometimes people just don't understand uh, that uh, that feeling relief and feeling deep grief are, are not at all mutually exclusive. They can happen just as intensely right at the same time. And people understand that more over non-stigmatized death than over stigmatized death. Sorry I went on and on about that a little bit, but um, it, uh, it is something that really, that really I hear a lot from people who are bereaved by, um, by substance use. Okay, so. I think we're doing okay for time. So this is kind of a transitional moment. So, so as, we, as we've gone through these, these different themes, as we've talked about why, and as, as we've talked about intention, and as we've talked about prevention and stigma, I've given these examples that I've called emotional responses. And here they all are that, that we, and they, so that you can see that they come from different places for different reasons, uh, from different perspectives that the bereaved person has. And so I just want to make a couple of points about these um, before we go on to talk about trauma. So first of all, the, the, way, the way these are being presented might, might lead a person to think, oh, um, the person's feeling guilty, we need to get rid of that guilt, you know, we need to help them fix that guilt, or, or a person is feeling angry, we need to, you know, help them get through that anger or, or fix that anger or escape from it. And basically, uh, when I said people navigate their way through grief, and when I said people are recreating their story and, and, and making meaning out of their loss, it is these things that provide fuel for that. And, and it's not that we want them to go unchecked or that people don't deserve comfort or help with these emotions, but basically these emotions are, are fuel for them to experience their grief as, as, I, as I tried to talk about. And we, we haven't talked a lot about, we kind of left the pain of grief you know, where it was when we talked about the task, but at the whole time, during the whole time, these uh, emotions and the pain of grief are reciprocal. They're intertwined with each other. So uh, I just am trying to make the point that this is really the stuff of grief and that when we say grief is natural and that we want to make a space for people to grieve, it is all this that, that we are making a space for them to experience. And I just, uh, I think that there's a good uh, analogy around that. 
and it's the analogy of a fever. So we know that a fever is a healing force, and as long as it doesn't get so bad that it uh, that it damages the person or kills the person, it is a healing force. At the same time, it can make the person feel feel horrible. In some ways, I would say that is a good analogy for grief, in that these things are a part of the healing, these experiences, I should say, are part of the healing force of grief. And again, people need help with them so that they don't get so strong that they damage them or, 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 or such as that. But these are um, healing forces. And, uh, and so it's just important that that we realize that this is what grief is really about, that this is the natural course of, of grief. So uh, trauma and distress. So the trauma and distress around a substance use death comes from a, from a number of, of places. And I'm just gonna go through these, um, or at least the, the top tier of the list of examples. So first of all, it's just shocking. Uh, it's just shocking uh, when you learn or, 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 or are in the proximity of, of your loved one dying of a sudden or violent death. And to some degree, I would also say that that um, the, the, the trauma that was experienced by the person who dies um, is to some extent kind of inherited by the bereaved person. They, they relive that in, in a certain way. The, the way they died from substance use um, sticks with them. Uh, they may be involved in a resuscitation attempt. As a matter of fact, it's not unusual for a family to be involved in more than one resuscitation attempt. So you can kind of imagine, you know, after I've been involved in several and the last one ends in a death, how, how traumatic that is. Uh, finding or identifying the body. The person's body may not be found for days or it may be otherwise damaged, damaged and that can be traumatic to people. Uh, People recreate virtual, you know, pictures or, or films of all of this, all of the above, what happened to their person, and uh, uh, that that can be traumatic. Uh, media and social media uh, provide no end of re-traumatizing um, events for for bereaved people uh, who whose person dies of substance use to experience, and finally. Uh, one of the effects of, of the epidemic, I would say, is that is that uh, it's like it's like the disaster effect it, in Massachusetts. Uh, Two thousand people uh, die of a, die of overdose uh, every year, and or well, the most recent years, I should say. Well, if two thousand people died in a hurricane, okay, that hit Massachusetts, that would be a major disaster, and it would have a certain effect around that. And so some of that some of that uh, is present even though the fatalities are spread out over time, you know, because it does seem like you're being overwhelmed by, by a disaster. So I just wanted to kind of point to, to this, this uh, column here. Uh, these are the emotional responses, uh, just like we listed with the, with, the other, uh, with the other themes. And I just want to say, you know, kind of look at how, how many there are and, and look at the subtleties. And so those examples we, we, we gave before were just sort of the, the ones that seem most obvious and, and, and the ones that really um, we know happen a lot. But, but uh, the emotional response to all of these things is, is, uh, is immense and is entangled uh, with the person's reason. I also give you the link to this, to this uh, CDC handout because uh, – it is, uh, you know, it has some, it has some great ideas about or, or, or tips about interacting with a person who's just had a trauma, traumatic experience, and um, how to, and some tips about how to be helpful. So, our our last topic, our last topic is um, is how the experiences of the bereaved people before the death occurs have an impact on them, on their grief, I'm talking about, after the death occurs, okay? Family dynamics, caring for a chronically ill person, and ambiguous loss are, are, are the places where, um, or are the topics of, of what affects a person 
before the death occurs. Okay, so family dam dynamics of substance use death. First of all, the large category is maladaptive behavior, and this is in the family system. And so I think the the most um, the most all inclusive way to say what what maladaptive behavior is around substance use disorder is that people in the family system take on roles or or behaviors that basically protect. Uh, the person who has a substance use disorder, we say protect the addiction so that, so that it can continue um, being a part of, of, of the system. Uh, another uh, thing that happens is that families can have an, adopt sort of a negative world view that's, that's pervasive. They can, see, they can see the world rather darkly or cynically or, or pessimistically, and you know, that becomes retrenched um, in the family. Other family substance use, and I think when you're talking about um, the disease of addiction, you just have to know that sometimes, a lot of times, actually, this is cross-generational. We have cross-generational um, people dying from overdose, um, and so that this is uh, this is really uh, part of the of the matrix of what happens uh, to people. And then finally, um, life disruptions. So. This is kind of the list of, of life disruptions that people experience um, or can experience um, before their person dies while they're struggling with, with the disease of addiction. And again, overdoses, we've, we've looked, at, we've looked at, 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 at many of these, but keep in mind that these may happen over, over a long period of time and they can be pervasive. And the thing that I wanna point out is Think about how these contribute to the trauma of losing a, a loved one to substance use disorder. So again, that, that idea of trauma or distress or, or, um, or toxic stress looms, looms large, um, and, it, and it can be carried over from when the person was alive to, uh, to the person's grief experience. Caring for a chronically ill person. So, so I'd just like to, uh, say that I really have come to believe that there is there are there are apt comparisons and valuable comparisons to be be made between caregiving for a person with substance use disorder and caregiving for a dying person like like in hospice although they're also different you know I want to acknowledge that but caregivers of people who uh, who uh, have substance use disorder they they, they actually experience, can experience uh, myriad losses, uh, practical losses like loss of security or, or, or loss, of, uh, uh, loss of safety, uh, relational losses, loss of intimacy, loss of mutuality in the, in the relationship. Uh, they face a life or death situation, and they may not face that constantly, but a life or death situation is pretty much always right around the corner or right on hand with the next phone call, right? So that causes fear and helpful, helpful, helplessness and can cause hypervigilance. And of course, we've talked a lot about the, the crises and the, and the experiences that people have in, in uh, family systems. Um, and when the worst happens, when the person dies, the caregiver may be at a place where, where they're depleted, where they're exhausted, uh, where they feel failure or, or guilt, or where they have a I have a sense that they've lost their, their purpose in life. Finally, uh, ambiguous loss. So ambiguous loss is uh, a death. It's like a death. This is what people say about it. It's like a death without the person dying. And this certainly happens uh, with people uh, who, who have substance use disorder that the person becomes estranged in a way where they're really gone. You know, they, they, are, they, are, they are physically present in that they're still in the world, but they're really gone in that they're, they're, they, you can't contact them uh, psychologically, right? That you can't have a relationship with them. Um, with addiction, ambiguous loss can also get the, the, the family tangled up in how the person gets lost, if you will. Uh, a great example of ambiguous loss 
us as Alzheimer's disease, and that's kind of something that happens to a person and happens to a family. But with families uh, who who are struggling with with uh, caring for a person with substance use disorder, you know, the person might become estranged because they they quit letting them live in the house or quit giving them money or or any manner of things where they get kind of um, implicated in it in, in a way and I don't mean they're actually implicated in it but they have that 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 feeling uh, from from that happening so Pauline boss who is uh, the guru of uh, of ambiguous law says that this is also inherently traumatic and so basically these things that happen before the death, the same family that woke up the morning before the death, all right, wakes up with the same dynamics the morning after the death. And so I'm just making the point that all this gets carried over into their grief. So in closing, I, I just, first of all, thank you for being here. I, I hope that looking at a person's grief through this lens, um, through this framework, helps you see uh, what the bereaved are going through uh, after a substance use death, it helps you see what's behind and, and beneath uh, their feelings, and all of that helps us better understand the experience they're having. If we have a deepened understanding, we can be more sympathetic to their plight, and we can make space for them and support them as they navigate the changed world they find themselves in. Um, and as they're finding meaning out of what took their loved one away from them and meaning in the present time experience of their, of their grief. So thank you very much for uh, your interest in this topic and, and for spending this time with me. I really appreciate your presence a great deal. All right. Um, Franklin, um, let me see. I'm going to take back the, the ball here. All right, and um, thank you very much. This this was um, a lot to take in, um, but it does give um, me a better understanding of some of the, the emotions people are going through. If you have questions, um, you're welcome to put them in the chat box right now. <clears throat> you know, one thing that occurred to me was um, we're seeing so many young adults um, dying, and if a person had cancer and they were young, that's a tragic death um, and hard for parents. And um, I just can't imagine, you know, how it feels to have a young person die of substance use disorder, um, you know, it's, you're dealing with two things, two different things here. Yeah, I'm, I'm not necessarily um, uh, an expert on the, on the demographics of who dies, but we know that it is, it is younger people and that their deaths, um, you know, not, not after a full life, you know, so that people's lives are interrupted and they're sudden. So that's absolutely a part of the deal. So <clears throat> I have a question here. Um, <clears throat> it says, I work with people who are actively using drugs and there is a collective trauma in the community due to these overdose deaths. Are there any suggestions on best practice for supporting grief in this community? Wow, what a, what a great question. <laughs> You know, and I'll just and I'll just tell you that um, that I don't I don't know of of best practices on, other than the standard things that you do with bereaved people. But this is so strongly on our radar in this uh, in this project that I just talked about uh, that that I'm doing, where one of the things that that we've that we've run into is sort of the overwhelming grief that people in active addiction or in early recovery or in long-term recovery feel because they've had sometimes many, many, many uh, fatalities. So first of all, the, the basic uh, practices of helping bereaved people, I think, should be more strenuously um, a part of all treatment programs because the other thing is that among the people whose grief is disenfranchised, uh, people 
people who um, people who are are quote just the friends, you know, are are even more um, disenfranchised. So um, you're on the right track asking this. And the first step I think is to you know look at how can we just get grief uh, grief assistance into you know our our, our programs and, and our curriculum. Yeah. And we have another question. Do you, do you use any specific format or program for your peer support, for example, grief after a substance passing or grasp? Well, you know, the, the answer is yes, yes, I do. Um, and it's pretty, it's, it's, but there are, there are many that are used. And I'm, I've actually, I'm not familiar with, with, with grasp model. But I can tell you that, that the model that I use is uh, peer, peer support, so to speak, so that, so that the facilitators are, are trained peers. And, you know, there's not a clinician uh, in the room, although the, hopefully there's a clinician within reach, <laughs> you know, and um, so to speak. I don't mean literally within reach. But the, the format that I use is, is pretty open-ended. It's a drop-in format so that you can come, you don't have to come for 10 weeks in a row, although I am really looking hard at the idea that we need to have some psychoeducational programs where you sign up. But the, the format that I use is, is pretty open-ended where, where we really are just sharing. And the only sort of structure around it is that people only are sharing about their grief and they're only sharing about their own, own experiences. Some support groups are more about advice giving or problem solving or even teaching a little bit. And mine is much more in line with, as you can see from what I was talking about, with letting people share their own experiences. And if everybody shares their own experience, then by that collective accumulative uh, process, people get what they need to get uh, about, um, about their grief. Um, and this um, next question follows exactly what you're saying. Um, it, it is, what are some practical skills we can provide our individual therapy clients for the issue of navigating social media and their community in the face of stigma after their loved one died? You know, what can they do? How can they cope with this trolling? Well, I, I think that, um, You know, again, without without getting without getting down in the weeds, and also, you know, with not uh, with not uh, saying something about about clinical clinical treatment. Here's here's what I would say in general: these are triggers, <laughs> you know. And what do we do uh, for people who are traumatized, you know, by triggers, you know? And there's different, you know, um, there's different uh, practices uh, and therapies that. That, that go with that. And so I would just say, these are triggers and can we, can we help people, you know, what basically has to do with, with not being exposed to them or with, with uh, learning to tolerate them or practicing tolerating them. Those kind of practices are what I would recommend. Okay, we have a few other questions here. I work in a public library where overdoses have become a regular occurrence. Do you have any suggestions for the staff who respond to these overdoses? Also, how can we better serve the loved ones who visit the library after? Wow. <clears throat> well, the, this is a, you know, this is a, this is a large, large question and it's actually, um, you know, it's actually one of the things you know, that I've been, been working on. Um, uh, and I've actually just finished a, a, a sort of a manual for front frontline service providers. And it, it's about to come out and I, and I should share that with you, but, but basically it's, it's about um, post event um, actions that, that you take. So, and to go through that would, would be a, a an exercise in itself, but when this comes out, I would certainly make it available to you, Susan, to share with people. And it's for frontline service providers, and so it might not precisely um, be the staff at a library, but that's the position you're in, is you're on the front lines of a death. And so I would, 
can you share that with everybody? If I sh if I share it with you, it's probably out in a week or two, and I and I will just share it. It's for public health workers, but it would apply. Yep. The other thing about about, um, about working with families, you know, is is also again to become aware of the basic um, of the basic how to interact with a person who is bereaved, to, to offer them comfort, to let them take the lead, um, to not say. I know how you feel. I mean, there's again, this is an entire topic unto itself about which there's a lot of information, but but there's you can become more skilled and maybe even have have a training. And you know, I don't know right off the top of my head, but um, um, becoming more skilled at interacting with great people is something that that we all should do. And there's a there's a lot of material um, available about about how to become more skilled with comforting of, of bereaved people. The other thing is, and this is also dif di difficult with substance use death, is are there local resources? Become aware of, of local resources, you know, if you can, um, um, to, to, to refer them to. So you're talking like bereavement groups. Bereavement um, groups, are there people who specialize in bereavement as, as counselors? Uh, all those, all those things. Okay, I have another question here. Can you diagnose these type of emotion, emotion responses and loss? And if so, is counseling a means of preventing prolonged or complicated grief sure. rather than accepting that the process is normal? Emotional responses yeah. to seem as, as if they can become yeah. stressor, which lead to unhealthy yeah. complications. Well, let me, let me just tell you how much I appreciate this, this question, because I think one of the things that I, that, I, um, that I worry about with this presentation, with my orientation to what is happening, is that I'm saying that people just have to bear their pain, or people just have to you know, go all the way through their anger in ways that are debilitating to them, or, or or things such as that. And so I think that there are ways that my orientation and my presentation uh, leads to that idea. And that's absolutely not what I'm saying. So in the middle of there somewhere, I, I tried to point out, and I should emphasize this more, more that people need, um, just like you say, counseling can be helpful to people. And if people are having stress to the point where it's toxic stress, then that needs to be, be addressed. So it's not like we're letting them, you know, there's some things about the pain of grief that you need to bear for a minute or two, all right? There's something about intense anger that we need, need to make space for in the immediate um, and not be judgmental or just, or just uh, discount it in the moment that it happens. But as people are working through this, they also need to, just like the, the comparison with a the fever, they also need to be, to be protected from that becoming damaging to them or that becoming debilitating to them or that harming them. And so that's exactly um, the point that, that, that I did not make strongly enough, you know, that all of those kinds of interactions and the, and, and the possible damage from, from, from toxic stress uh, need to be accounted for and, and responded to in a helpful way. Okay, I have an, another question. I've responded, and this is related um, to the previous question, I've responded to two overdose death calls as a peer recovery specialist, and I always felt awkward. We mostly just provided guidance, but what is the best way to support someone in situations of short interaction? Well, I think um, I think in, in in short interactions, um, being there for the person, making sure that they they um, that they have the support of the closest people around them, um, uh, making sure that you have resources available for them, uh, being present with them, and making sure that in a way. Um, the environment they they're in is a place where they can where they can feel what, what they're feeling and where it's safe for them. So I would say the most important thing is to provide a safe place to. So basically, here's the here's the short version of it. 
promote calm, promote safety, um, promote connectedness, promote hope, and promote self-efficacy. In other words, them uh, doing things that empower them. So that's the, that's the big five of, of disaster response rules in general, to find ways to promote those things, um, calm, hope, safety, connectedness, and self-efficacy. That's the rule uh, that, that, that you should follow in general, but find specific ways to do that in the environment that you work in. All right, great, thank you. Um, Thank you very much, Franklin. Unfortunately, um, it is two o'clock and we have to end. Um, <clears throat> I did put the evaluation link and the enrollment code in the chat box. If you're getting MLA credit for this webinar, you'll need to fill out um, an evaluation. If you're not getting credit, we still value um, your feedback, so please um, fill out an evaluation if possible. I did want to point out if you felt that this webinar was helpful, you may be interested in our next webinar um, <clears throat> that's happening on January 29th. Um, it's about drug courts being a bridge to recovery, and we have a local um, judge who oversees um, the drug court in Dudley, Massachusetts, and a graduate who will be presenting. And um, this slide is, is just instructions if um, you are not familiar with how to go about getting credit. And again, this will be part of the package you can access um, when you get the recording link. All right, everybody, we're gonna say goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Frank. you so much, everyone. I so appreciate it. Okay. All right, bye now.